Hello. Today I'm going to tell you guys um, the story of this American helmet that was found in southern France. And uh, more importantly, I'm going to tell you all the story about the 65th Infantry Regiment and their uh, Colonel George A. Ford that I managed to find out after investigating the story of this helmet. So the helmet was found uh, by a local resident in the, in the French Alps and he told me he had found it in the fork of a tree in a, in a steep ravine near the village of Peracava, which is uh, in the mountains uh, near Nice. See, this is a map of southern France. You have the Mediterranean Sea. This is Nice and the Peracava area is here where the star is. And you'll notice it's at the Italian border the border between Italy and France. And that's because in August 1944 there was a, an invasion here uh, west of Nice and the Allied troops liberated the area. But then it was decided that they wouldn't try to cross through the mountains into Italy. So then there was static warfare going on uh, at the border uh, during several months until almost the very end of the war. So this is the, what the helmet looks like. It's uh, still in pretty good condition because uh, it was not buried. In the mountains, things usually, you know, lie on rocks and stuff. And uh, in this case, it was actually in, a, in the fork of a tree, like I said. It probably rolled down a hill and then landed in the tree. And um, the first thing you notice is that the helmet uh, has remains of camouflage paint. You see it has a, a black line painted here. There seems to be some yellow, then some green. Of course, it's rusty, so you can't see it uh, too nicely but it is a camouflaged helmet. And um, like I said, it was, it was found in Perikava, which is a village where the 517th and 509th parachute infantry were active for a couple of months. And um, the 509th and 517th had jumped into southern France for the invasion, and they had been uh, camouflaged with spray paint, their uniforms, their helmet, all their things, so they, they looked like this, basically. And um, if you want to know more details about that, I made a video explaining the, the whole story in the, in the Marvin Moles video, so you can watch that if you're more interested. So, because the 517th and 509th uh, had camouflaged items, I made the assumption that this helmet, found in an area where the paratroopers were involved and also camouflaged, must belong either to the 517th or to the 509th. But, there is a little but. You see, if you look closely at the front of the helmet, it has an insignia carved into it. A Malta cross. And I had no idea what that meant. I figured it must be, you know, something that had a personal meaning to one of the paratroopers. And if you look very closely under the Malta cross, it kind of looks like there might be a number carved here. To me, it looked like 69. But I'm not totally sure about that. It could just be the rust. Anyways, I ended up asking on an internet forum if anybody knew what this Malta cross was on my paratrooper helmet. And uh, one guy answered and he said, uh, I really like the helmet, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure it's not paratrooper. And uh, he said that he thinks the insignia on the front of the helmet is for the 65th Infantry Regiment. So I was slightly disappointed because, uh, of course, paratrooper things are usually uh, more interesting. And uh, plus, I had absolutely never heard of any 65th Infantry Regiment, but I looked it up. And uh, sure enough, I found out that there was a, a 65th Infantry Regiment that existed. It consisted of Puerto Rican soldiers, most of them who uh, only spoke Spanish. And the unit's insignia, insignia is a Malta cross. And uh, you see if you compare it to the helmet, well, yeah, that, that's pretty convincing. Uh, the unit's number is uh, 65, and on the helmet I thought I could see a 69 carved, but actually it might, be, it might be 65. And when I was doing this research in 2005, the Wikipedia page said that in September 1944, the 65th Infantry landed in southern France and was committed to action at Paracava. So yeah, it's a perfect match. The, the helmet was found at Paracava. It has the, the insignia on the front, so uh, now I'm convinced. The helmet is not a paratrooper helmet. It is a helmet that belonged to a soldier of the 65th Infantry and that he must have lost in 1944-45 uh, when the unit was down there. Now, at the time, there was uh, almost uh, no information about the unit on Wikipedia. But another thing that it said uh, on the internet 
uh, was that the commanding officer of the 65th Infantry Regiment had been reported missing in action in the Paracava area. Now, if you've watched a few of my videos, you know that when I find out somebody is missing in action, well, that's kind of like waving a, a, red, uh, a red flag in front of a bull, right? That gets me excited and I want to solve the, solve the case. So I looked into this, this 65th Infantry Regiment and this story of their commanding officer going missing and uh, now I'm going to show you the, the results of my investigation. So we're going to start by taking a look at uh, the Paracava area from the air. So you see it's a mountainous region. Paracava is down here. And um, the unit positions at the time, the front lines were like this. You had uh, basically the mountain uh, range has the shape of a U. And uh, on the eastern side, the Germans were in position, and on the western side, the Germans were in position. The Americans were also down in the valley, and they were also in position at the southern end of the Germans' mountain range. And the units that were present, so as we said, the 65th, uh, the 3rd Battalion only of the 65th Infantry Regiment was in the Paracava area. The other two battalions were somewhere else in France and uh, were not involved. And then here in the southern uh, part at Moulinet, there was also the 442nd Regimental Combat Team in place. So you may have heard of the Nisei, the Japanese-American soldiers during World War II. And uh, this was them. So it was, I think, the most decorated unit of the U.S. Army. They had been fighting in Italy and stuff like that before being, uh, being posted here in southern France. And then when it comes to the Germans, uh, the unit holding the mountains here was the 107th Infantry Regiment of the 34th Infantry Division. And this was a unit that had spent years on the Eastern Front, and they didn't mess around. They were highly experienced uh, German troops. Now this is what the area actually looks like in reality. You see you have this big valley in the middle, and the Americans were on the western side, and the Germans on the eastern side. And uh, this is what the American lines look like uh, from the German point of view. So Paracava is this area here. It's uh, 1, 000, uh, about 1,500 meters above sea level. And then this is what the German lines look like from the American point of view. You can see the terrain is very difficult, and in some of the areas it's, it's, it's completely impassable. Uh, this is uh, the German positions. This is also the German positions and then the Americans facing them. So you can see that this terrain uh, is an extremely unhospitable area and not a fun place to be fighting a war. And um, like I said, the war that was going on here was static warfare. Nobody was planning to advance. So it was basically just sitting around observing each other, artillery fire, and then making patrols, and uh, guys often getting wounded on, on, by stepping on mines, uh, usually their own mines, actually. So now let's get into uh, Colonel Ford. Colonel Ford was an American officer, a West Pointer, and uh, he was 42 years old in uh, 1944. And as far as I've been able to determine, he had never been in combat, and uh, he was not uh, an experienced infantry officer. And uh, previously, during the war, before being sent to Paracava, you can see that here, uh, from uh, June 1944 until November, he had been chief transportation. Uh, he, had been the, he had been the chief of transportation. And all of a sudden, in uh, December 1944, he's transferred to the 65th Puerto Rican Infantry Regiment in Paracava. And we can know what he thought about that because he wrote a letter home to his wife. And this is what he says. I arrived at my command post yesterday afternoon. I found it in a tiny hamlet 5,000 feet up in the Maritime Alps. It is a jewel of a setting, the most gorgeously magnificent scenery I have ever encountered. It is futile to attempt to describe it. A tumbled sea of mountains all around, rugged gray masses dusted with snow, and snow-covered rangers interspersed. So those are kind of like the pictures I just showed you. And um, he continues the letter. I'm so darned happy over the situation that I am likely to burst into song at any moment. My surroundings are such that it is a shame to take the taxpayers' money for being here. I have my own command again, and in a combat zone, 
doing work that I love and can be enthusiastic over again, and with a unit which appears basically excellent but in need of lots of work. It is just perfect, or would be if you were here too. Short of that, I have been so very lucky and after the last miserable six months too that I can hardly keep down to earth, nor need you have the least concern over my safety. It is a nice quiet little war we have here, and my only risk is of bumping my head against a cloud. A merry, merry Christmas to the best and sweetest wife and family ever. I shall be thinking of you even more than usual, and as always, sending all my love. So this letter was written on December 15th, 1944. And uh, if we read through the lines and look at the situation, what we actually see is that Colonel Ford, so a person with no combat experience, um, is being transferred to a non-English speaking infantry unit that he has no experience with, he's never seen them before, and he's transferred to them on the very day that they are sent to the front lines. Uh, so that's kind of strange. Usually units are supposed to be, you know, trained together, the officers, the men before being sent to combat, and this guy is parachuted into the unit exactly as they're sent to the front lines, and despite the fact that he himself does not have any combat experience. About the unit, he says it's excellent, but he also says it's in need of lots of work, so you can wonder what he means by that. And the uh, last thing, the guy, he's being sent to a war zone, and um, it's interesting, actually, the, in his letter, he's just totally happy about this, you know. He's probably been waiting his whole life to be sent to, to combat, and now he finally is in a combat area. So let's see now what, what happens to the unit. This is the unit um, radio log, so all the communications are, are written down. And uh, you can see, so December 13th, uh, the unit arrives in Paracava area. All units in position and relieving units of the 442nd. So the, the Japanese American soldiers had been there before, and now the 65th is, uh, is taking over. So that's December 13th. And December 14th, uh, first day on the lines, Colonel George A. Ford arrived to the command post and assumed command of the regiment. So I've been, I, I was reading through these pages and it's um, just, you know, the daily activities. It says we have a patrol out here, a patrol out there, uh, Germans bombed this area, bombed that area. And as I read through the pages, what I see uh, puts me in a state of, let's say, complete disbelief. I've never seen something like this before in, uh, in an American unit diary. So it starts on uh, December 19th, 1944, at 18.35. It says, Private Luis accidentally shot his toe, left foot, in a dugout. So that's kind of, uh, it can be an accident, you know, and, uh, but it also looks like it could be a, a self-inflicted wound, whatever. There's just one case, right? But then I keep on reading. December 19th at 18.30. Private First Class Felix shot his arm when he slipped on ice at 18.30. So this is getting a bit suspicious. Then, December 21st, 1835. Private Raphael shot his right arm with a pistol accidentally. 22nd December at uh, 025. One member of the Guard Reserve accidentally discharged his rifle and injured his right hand. Then, just afterwards, 145, Private Gustavo, while posting the guard, accidentally discharged his rifle and shot his left hand. So two guys shoot themselves in the hand uh, within one hour. 23 December at 22.33. So there's a situation where they say, um, Company Al, two, two men from Company Al were on guard when they saw a man running through the woods in the direction of the command post. They threw hand grenades at the man. At the same time, other men up the hill started throwing grenades. Private First Class Alejo stepped out of the dugout and was caught by a grenade thrown by men up the hill. Private First Class Alejo lost his hand. So this guy had a grenade blow up near him and it ripped off his hand. A bit strange. And then a bit later, the medical uh, team sent a message. They say, Private Alejo was injured in his left hand by a hand grenade during an alert. 
He says he pulled the pin out of the grenade to throw it to the enemy. The grenade fell into a foxhole. When he tried to pick it up again, he was injured by the explosion. So this guy, his grenade falls in a foxhole, and instead of leaving it there, he goes and tries to pick it up with his left hand. Uh, this obviously is extremely suspicious. What's also neat is you see that at the time they thought that having a hand blown off was not a serious condition. Now, December 23rd at 2.58, Private David, Company Al, was wounded on his right hand, apparently by a hand grenade explosion. The only person that can give details about this incident is the wounded man, as nobody knows how it happened. So you see there's been this series of highly suspicious accidents, and now it looks like they're catching on. They're saying, like, uh, nobody witnessed this incident, so they're getting suspicious. And then later on, uh, there's another message. It says that this uh, wounded man, he was on guard duty and he saw a blue light approaching and later heard an explosion in front of the lights. He tried to throw a hand grenade and it exploded in his hand. And then the medical team writes over, traumatic amputation left hand caused by a blast of hand grenade. So I hope this guy was left handed because uh, he was trying to throw the grenade with his left hand according to, to what they're saying. Now we continue, December 25th at 9.15. Company L reports that Private Ramos suffered injuries from a hand grenade which blew off his left hand, blowing off four fingers. This happened while the man was holding a fragmentation grenade in his left hand and the safety pin with his right hand. He then slipped and the grenade went off, as explained by Lieutenant Urutia. The man is being sent to the dispensary. There are no witnesses to this action. Colonel Cordero ordered an investigation to be made of this incident. Okay, so finally, we have eight suspicious incidents in a period of six days. And finally, uh, the commanding officer of the 3rd Battalion is asking for an investigation to be made. And once again, in this case, you see the guy says he wanted to throw a grenade, but for some reason he's holding it in, in his left hand, you know, kind of strange. So the question is, what what was going on? What was going on? Now, I spoke to quite a few American veterans who were, who were in this area of Perikava and who were in neighboring units. And what they basically all told me, they told me that these Puerto Rican guys, see, they come from a tropical island and they're sent to their first combat assignment in December in the French Alps when it's freezing cold. And what they said is that these guys were miserable. They were miserable, see? And plus, um, I suspect quite a few of these guys were very religious. And you see all these accidents happen just a few days before Christmas. So that probably also might have had a role. And uh, this is a picture of the guy just in the snow. And um, we'll just take a closer look at the helmet. I'm not sure about this, but you see there seems to be something carved in the paint. It looks like this guy might also have carved a Malta cross in his helmet. But let's get back to our, our incidents. So the, uh, the other American soldiers said these Puerto Ricans were, were really miserable. And uh, here's a couple of accounts from, uh, from Americans that I managed to find. So this guy here, he says that uh, they were stationed in a village nearby. And one morning they received a call from the 65th Infantry saying that one of their observation posts had called in obviously very agitated and stated that they were in terrible conditions and demanded to talk to President Roosevelt immediately. So this guy went up to the, the Puerto Ricans and he found that they were uh, lying directly on the ground in the snow with their sleeping bags and uh, obviously they were, they were miserable. So uh, they helped them uh, install a, a dugout and uh, something like that so they'd be more comfortable. This is another American witness account. So he was in position at the time the, the Japanese guys were there. Then he says, Then, to our consternation, the Nisai were replaced in our area by troops of the 65th Infantry Regiment, comprising troops from Puerto Rico. The new troops lacked the fighting spirit that characterized the fine warriors they replaced, and many were overwhelmed by the severity of winter conditions in the Alps. After the confidence and pride we had felt in working with the Nisai, there was a notable change in our feelings as we adjusted to working with the new troops. And uh, then he was a witness 
of uh, one of these uh, so-called accidents. He, was, uh, he says he was speaking to, to some, uh, some of the Puerto Rican guards one night and they had uh, seen a jeep drive by with a, a, a wounded guy inside who had uh, shot himself. And then he says that um, they heard a gunshot and we quickly learned that they were the same infantry guards we had talked with only a short while earlier and that one of them had shot himself through the hand and was in a state of shock. When we got them to the aid station, I had a look at the man's hand. It had been blasted apart by the force of a 30 caliber slug, erupting bones and flesh through the back of the hand beyond any hope of repair. An appalling wound and a shameful scar to carry through life. Evidence of a terrible fear overriding all considerations of pain or disgrace. His action was a punishable offense for cowardice, but most immediately important for him was the assurance that his command days that his combat days were over. I learned from the medic that the man we brought was the fourth already that night. Now what is Colonel Ford thinking of all this? We read his first letter where he was uh, extremely happy about being in the front lines with a Puerto Rican unit. And now what does he say? He writes a new letter on December 30th, two weeks later. I have a major operation and personnel shakeup to be performed. I called in all my officers today, that is, all I could safely take out of positions, and laid down the law. Last night I relieved my second in command and sent him to the brigade commander with a letter to the effect that I never again wanted to see him. It will cause some surprises in view of the fact that my predecessor recommended him to take command. I gather that, as usual, I am regarded as a very mean old mm mm mm. I do not mind that in the slightest, but I hate to think of the long, hard job I have to do. It is difficult to change people's way of thought and to lift them bodily out of a really deep rut. So you can see that in two weeks, uh, Colonel Ford is now very discontent with his unit. And uh, he sees he's going to have a lot of work to do. And he mentions his uh, getting rid of his second in command. So the second in command, as far as I know, was the commander of the 3rd Battalion of the 65th. His name was uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cordero. And uh, there's a, an account by one of the soldiers, Benjamin Vega, that mentions uh, the relations between Cordero and Ford. This is an account that... These are, these are notes from an interview that uh, Noemi Figueroa, uh, a historian of the 65th, made. So there's not the full interview, but luckily she did take notes. So, Benjamin Vega remembers that Colonel Ford was a strict professional soldier. One time when they were at Peracava in an empty warehouse, Cordero, who was the commander of the 3rd Battalion when it was in his underwear, face down on a cot, taking a nap. Ford passed by, spanked Cordero and gave him an order. Cordero relayed the order to a major, the major went down the line and eventually it ended up with a corporal. Ford passed by again and saw Cordero still sleeping on the cot, so he overturned the cot and started yelling at him. Cordero did not speak English well, and he used to pass the buck a lot. He was not, he, uh, this is Benjamin Vega, was not impressed with Cordero as a leader. And when you look into Cordero's uh, history some more, you see that he was also involved in the Korean War with the 65th Infantry, and he was relieved as a, of his command in, in Korea, so... Ford wanted to relieve him of his command after just two weeks in combat. And then in Korea, you see it says, Kendall recomm recommended the relief of Cordero, whom the general adjudged incapable of properly commanding a regiment of infantry in combat. Kendall described a colonel who was nervous and incoherent and utterly futile in judgment. And he even mentions that in Korea, Cordero earned the nickname Cordero the Butcher. So I guess that would be uh, Cordero el Carnicero in Spanish. So, n probably not the kind of commanding officer you would like to have. So, what happened after all this? Well, Colonel Ford doesn't say anything more. I'll see why. But what we see is, four days after he wrote his letter, his angry letter we just saw, this is what happens. The commanding officer, so Colonel Ford, left with a patrol of the Regimental Intelligence and Reconnaissance Platoon, for the vicinity of the cable house near Fort La Forca to make a reconnaissance. Weather five degrees below zero, cold and foggy, visibility fair. 
So now you have a regimental commander, a colonel, going forward on a, on a, on a patrol to, to, to the German lines. Something completely abnormal. Um, what's the reason for this? Well, you saw how unhappy he was and he said we were going to have to do a lot of work. My guess is that he may have figured, like, I'm going to actually personally show these guys how it's done by going on a patrol myself. Another thing that I heard is that uh, Ford apparently didn't believe the, the reports that the patrols were giving him. So he wanted to go on a patrol himself and make sure that they were actually going towards the German lines as they claimed. This is the terrain that the patrol had to cross, like we saw before. So they're going to go down one side into the valley and then up the other side to the German positions. This is the actual location where the, the patrol went, to this place that they called the Cable House. And what happened during the patrol? Well, this is what the, the period reports say. Sergeant Hurtado uh, arrived from mission and informed that Colonel Ford, member of the patrol, was wounded and missing, probably killed, as the patrol had been attacked out and outnumbered by the enemy. Results, two killed and three wounded. And then they say that uh, they're waiting for confirmation of this report by Captain D.B. Logan, who's expected to give more detailed information. So D.B. Logan was in the artillery, and as far as I understand, he was a member of the patrol um, as a forward observer. So they did a big investigation afterwards to find out what had happened, and uh, two, two people wrote uh, first-hand accounts, I guess the two ranking people who were there. The first one is Sergeant uh, Robles of the 65th Infantry. And he says, so they got up the mountain, near where the German uh, positions were. And this is what he describes. When we got to the rifle pit, Colonel Ford gave a signal to stop, which I did. He walked up to me and told me that we were close to the enemy positions. I continued with my patrol to the left of the ridge. He also told me that he would continue to the right with Captain Logan behind. I warned the Colonel twice that he was exposed. I told that to the colonel, because I have been there before, and he grinned. Then I continued with my patrol to the position that he told me to take. He kept going with Captain Logan until he reached to a place about 25 yards from the cable house. I could see the colonel standing up, observing through field glasses. So if you read through the lines here, uh, the impression you get is that the soldiers are kind of looking in disbelief at what's happening. See, they're going very near the German positions, uh, probably for no good reason. Uh, the colonel is exposed, and when he's told that he's exposed, instead of taking action, he smiles, he grins. So this is probably the colonel's first real patrol. And the impression we get is that he's really lacking experience and that Nobody dares say anything to him, though, because he, he's the colonel, right? So the colonel goes towards the German position, the cable house, and he looks at them with field glasses. Oh, uh, this is the, what the cable house looks like, by the way. This is the area where the, the Americans came up, and the Germans were, were in this cable house. This is the cable house nowadays. It still has lots of uh, holes in the wall from artillery fire. So Colonel Ford was looking at the cable house, and now the second witness uh, go, comes in, so Captain Logan from the artillery. He says, there was a double tree. I put my rifle between the tree and put it to my shoulder, aiming at the house. The colonel stepped out from behind the tree to the left and advanced in the direction of the house. He took about three or four steps, slightly crouching, when there was one single shot fired from the direction of the cable house. After the shot, I heard the colonel's carbine hit the ground. I looked in his direction and saw him lying down on the ground on his back in the axis of his movement, his head towards the cable house. I asked the colonel, Where were you hit, colonel? He replied, Logan, I'm hit in the back. Right after he said that, he drew his knees up and stretched out and quivered. I could see blood was flowing from his mouth. After that, I called at the colonel. Colonel, come to me, and there was no answer. I remained in my position about a minute, and before I left, I took another look at him, and he looked to me like he was dead. 
So the colonel advanced towards the house and, not very surprisingly, got shot. And uh, now the, the Logan went back. Uh, he told the sergeant to try to retrieve the body. In the meantime, more Germans came. Uh, an enlisted man, Aristides Calles, was shot and killed. Three of the Puerto Rican uh, soldiers were wounded. The sergeant who went to get the body didn't manage to, to, to see the body. He was fired at by the Germans. So the whole patrol just retreated and left the colonel's body where he had died uh, within a few meters of the German positions. Now, what are the consequences of this, you see? So, uh, as we said, the colonel is missing, one soldier is killed and three are wounded. And uh, Lieutenant Colonel Cordero, who was supposed to be fired, now he's in command of the regiment because the colonel is dead or missing. And uh, another patrol went to the area, a rescue patrol, but they were fired at by the Germans. They also couldn't find the body. They could do nothing, so they also came back. So what are the, the conclusions of all this, you know? We don't have many documents, but one document that does still exist is a letter that Colonel Ford's father-in-law, called Kurt von Seidlitz, wrote to the U.S. Army. And this is what he says. Since I wrote you in September, I have heard a number of stories supposed to be circulating among the 65th Infantry Regiment and friends of the Colonel. Colonel Ford, taking over the command of the 65th, met with considerable difficulties to get discipline and combat abilities in the regiment. Colonel Ford, commander of the regiment, led personally a patrol of one officer and 12 men. I understand, actually, Two battalions were under his command with the 6th Army and the 1st Battalion with the 7th Army. Would this not suggest that there was something not normal in his action? Colonel Ford was wounded through a shot in the back and ordered the patrol to return and leave him as he was done for, bleeding from the mouth. He was not dead at this moment. The officer and 11 men, one man wounded, leave the colonel dying on the top of the Maritime Alps in January and an easy prey to the enemy. One man of the, returning, of the returning patrol observed from a tree the taking of the colonel's body by the enemy pillbox. This apparently caused the report, missing in action on January 4th, 1945. The story is told that Colonel Ford was shot by one of the men of the patrol. Over one year has passed by and not a word from the Quartermaster General, Grave Registration Section, Washington, D.C., regarding the body and personal effects has reached me or Mrs. Ford. In your letter of the 21st, you promised that she would be promptly notified. If the body of, the Colonel, of Colonel Ford can be found, an examination of the body will undoubtedly certify the fact if there is any truth in the story of his being shot by one of the men of his patrol. With this letter from the father-in-law, you see that there's a bunch of rumors going around and that uh, one of the rumors is that Colonel Ford was actually shot in the back by one of his own men during the patrol. And um, what happened to the body and what happened when they found it and examined it? So Colonel Ford's body was found almost one year later in September 1945, several months after the war was finished. They found it in the area where he was killed in the German positions, and the Germans had buried him and, uh, and put a cross on his grave. And um, regarding the cause of death, uh, the people who exhumed the body probably had no idea about this controversy, so they probably just looked at it like any other body, and they wrote that they were unable to determine the cause of death, because the, bo the body would have been, uh, you know, severely decomposed by then, and you would need an, an expert anthropologist or forensic pathologist to be able to, to say anything from looking at the body. These uh, graves registration guys weren't, didn't have the training for, for that kind of thing. So let's summarize all the information we have. Was Colonel Ford killed in action or was he shot by his own men? So what's, what are the facts? The facts is that his body was recovered by the Germans and buried in the German positions, which is proof that he did die very near the German lines. On the patrol, he was not the only person to be killed, see? Another soldier was, uh, was also killed, and three soldiers were wounded. So that proves that there really was a firefight with the Germans. There wasn't just uh, one guy who shot somebody in the back. 
And on the patrol, there was another U.S. officer, the Captain Logan. And he was not Puerto Rican. He was not from the 65th. He was an independent guy from an artillery unit. So he didn't know the people well. And he would have uh, no reason to lie, let's say. And he says that he saw Colonel Ford being shot from the German lines. So, yeah. And then what do we have uh, in the opposite direction? We have the fact that Ford said that he was hit in the back. And then we have this kind of strange circumstances that uh, Ford wanted to get rid of Cordero, the second in command. And then a couple of days later, you know, he's killed. And then Cordero becomes the commander. So that circumstance is, uh, could, could lead to some, let's say, c conspiracy ideas. So what's my opinion, you see, is that all the stronger evidence we have shows that Colonel Ford actually died at the German lines during a firefight uh, with the Germans. And uh, of course the circumstances of his death uh, could lead to some rumors, but rumors, you know, are not facts. So my personal opinion is that he was simply uh, killed in action during a foolhardy patrol that he had uh, organized himself. And um, you can wonder about what's this thing of being shot in the back, you know? Well, there's two, there's two explanations, I think, for that. One thing is that when somebody is shot with a rifle from close up, like the case is here, the bullet usually goes in and out. So if he was shot, let's say, in the chest and it came, the bullet came in from in front and went out by behind, uh, you know, maybe he would feel pain in the front more, maybe in the back more, who knows, because there's actually a hole in the front and in the back. That's one thing. The other thing is that when people get shot, sometimes they, they have a split second to see that they're going to get shot. And they have time as a reflex to turn around, and then they end up getting shot in the back, even though they were actually facing the person, the, person, the shooter, just instants before. So those are two explanations that, that I could see why he said he was shot in the back. Now, Colonel Ford, you see, we saw in this presentation that he, he wasn't experienced in combat. He had a kind of uh, slightly childish approach to this, like he's being sent to a war zone and he's overjoyed to be sent to a war zone. And uh, he leads this patrol that he should never have gone on as a regimental commander. And he does it in a way that's quite obviously irresponsible and foolhardy and as a consequence he's killed one of his men is killed and several men are wounded um, but I still feel you know I feel for this guy he was uh, trying to do his duty he was trying to get a unit into shape um, he was killed in the front lines leading his men into action you know he was a brave man and um, he also had children, you know, he had a wife and uh, he had, in, the, in one of the last letters he sent, he had wished them a Merry Christmas and then a few days later he was killed in action. And, um, you know, he said, all I risk is bumping my head against the cloud and unfortunately, uh, he probably did bump his head against the clouds a few times, as you can see in this picture. But uh, in the end, he bumped into a, a German sniper's bullet, was... Uh, shot and killed in the, in the snow, abandoned, picked up by enemy troops, buried in a shallow grave, and missing in action for, for almost one year before he was found again. So his story is, uh, is also quite tragic. So all this came to light thanks to, thanks to finding this helmet near Paracava. So this is another soldier that comes out of obscurity. And uh, of course what I said in this presentation uh, doesn't necessarily reflect very nicely on the 65th Infantry Regiment, uh, all these self-inflicted wounds and stuff, and Cordero being, uh, being relieved of command. But um, it's not because eight guys shot themselves in the hand uh, that everybody, you know, were cowards. These guys were from a tropical island. Um, whoever had the idea of sending them into the, the French Alps without any special training and stuff, you know, that was not a good idea. They were given a new commanding officer when they were already on the front lines. Uh, all this seems to have been very poorly organized. And, you know, these guys were far from home and fighting a war that wasn't really their war. So, uh, 
most of them did their duty, the vast majority of them. They, they held the positions like they were told. In the end, in total, 12 men were killed. So, uh, mostly by mines and artillery. Also, quite a few uh, accidents happened. But, you know, they were there. And um, for World War II standards, having 12 killed in a battalion over a, over a two-month period isn't, isn't too much. But, uh, you know, if you look at these losses nowadays, uh, those would be considered heavy losses for a unit in a, in a two-month period. So I'd like to pay homage to, to these Puerto Rican guys who, who came to France and got killed here. Now, there wasn't supposed to be a part two to this video, but um, this video caused quite a few reactions, uh, comments and stuff, uh, because of the kind of controversial nature it had. And so, a few months later, I'm making a part two, uh, which shows uh, some new documents I found and also answers some of the questions and the criticisms that were made. So, one of the things that many people said uh, regarding my investigation about Colonel Ford's death is that I should look into the German archives and see what they say about the patrol. Now, that's easier said than done, because uh, what actually happens when you look for German archives for this late in the war, so 1945, is that usually you have nothing, or nothing at, let's say, company and regimental level. So in this case, well, we know that the unit facing Colonel Ford uh, was the Grenadier Regiment 107 of the 34th Infantry Division, and I already looked uh, their archives up years ago, and there's nothing detailed at all. For January. So what I've been doing for years and years is um, whenever I have the names and particulars of a German soldier who was uh, in the Nice area, I try to contact his family in the hopes that they might have a picture like this picture or else any documents uh, like letters and diaries and stuff. And it's a very inefficient method and I've found very few things. But in this case, uh, shortly after making the first part of the Colonel Ford video, I had a real windfall because uh, the daughter of a German officer, Oberleutnant Blume, contacted me and said she has several letters that he wrote uh, when he was in southern France. And Oberleutnant Blume was in the 5th Company of uh, Grenadier Regiment 107. So the exact units that were facing um, the 65th Infantry Regiment. So let's see what he says in, in his letters. And I stress again, having found this is extremely, extremely lucky, even though it's, it's not much. So the first thing that's interesting is his letters are almost a copy and paste of what uh, Colonel Ford is writing in his letters. See, he's saying, during my first walk through my area, there was a glorious summer weather and I witnessed nature's beauty through an unimaginable blaze of colors. All around me the steep mountains, the lower slopes of which sparkled of gold autumn foliage, while the peaks were already covered in deep snow, and further in the background, the sea. My dearest Lieselote, the pictures of undisturbed natural beauty that offer themselves to the eye here cannot be described in words. And then, just like Colonel Ford, he's also telling his wife that there's a like, kind of peaceful war going on here, so she shouldn't be worried. As for me, as usual, I can only give the best of news. I'm now completely settled into my company and can only say that there really can be no finer duty than this one. For the moment, we're living a war here of the type that can be very well endured. You really shouldn't have any worries about me. Now, of course, when I'm going through these letters, I'm really looking forward to the letter that he wrote in early January to see if he's going to mention Ford's patrol or not. And sure enough, on January 5th, 1945, so the day of Ford's patrol, he writes one brief line and says, In the afternoon, there was another strong American patrol that we wiped to a shine without any losses of our own. And wiped to a shine, I'm not sure what that is supposed to mean exactly, but it's obviously something bad for the patrol, and I suspect it means the equivalent of being wiped out. So he's not saying, oh, we heard some strange gunfire in the forest and then found a dead American officer or whatever. He's saying that in a, strong, a strong American patrol came to their lines and that they eliminated it. So um, this for me is confirmation, once again, more evidence to prove that Ford was simply shot uh, by the Germans uh, and not shot by his own men like some rumors were, were having it 
at the time. And uh, interestingly, uh, two days after the patrol, Oberleutnant Blumer receives a telegram from his wife that their uh, first daughter is just born, uh, Gisela. So in the letter of the next day, he says that uh, his soldiers are, you know, congratulating him. The, he's having uh, drinks of alcohol with his soldiers and stuff. And then, really amazing for me, it's, it says, During a speech in the name of the company, the company sergeant major gave me an American silver dollar that has been found after the encounter with the last American patrol as a birthday present for little Gisela. Oberleutnant Holtz will bring it home to you in the next days. So Holtz was going, uh, going back to Germany on leave, and he lived in the same area as Oberleutnant Blume. So um, he was going to bring the silver dollar back and give it to, to Blume's wife as a birthday present for their young child that was just born. Um, unfortunately, this Gisela, who's still alive now and who sent me the letters, has no recollection at all of this uh, silver dollar. And presumably, either uh, Colonel Ford or else Aristides Calles, so the two men who were killed, must have had that silver dollar on them. It was kind of a tradition sometimes to give soldiers a precious coin to say, like, here, I'm lending you this dollar and when you come back, you'll give me my dollar back. It was kind of a way of wishing them that they would survive and wishing them luck. So it's not very rare to find uh, precious silver or gold coins with the bodies of soldiers. Um, another thing that's very incredible here is that this uh, Captain Holtz, who was supposed to bring the silver dollar back, while his helmet was found uh, in the forest, uh, in the area where this patrol happened, uh, about 20 years ago, you can see here it says, Lieutenant Holtz. So that's his helmet. It was found in the location where his company was and stuff. So that's uh, another kind of stroke of luck that happens in this research. So that's the information from the German side. Not much, but it confirms uh, what we already know, that the patrol went to the German lines, got shot at, and returned with, uh, with heavy losses. Um, now, <clears throat> these are the two guys who were killed, so uh, Ford and uh, Kallis. And uh, Kallis' family watched my, uh, my video and they weren't happy because I didn't um, go into details about the fact that Kallis had received a silver star during the patrol. And I have to say that I actually agree with them with that because the fact that Kallis received a silver star is more evidence that, uh, that there was a fight against the Germans and that this wasn't some kind of uh, murder occurring between between Puerto Rican soldiers, and so I uh, I looked some more and I managed to to get a copy of his uh, Silver Star citation from the archives, and uh, you see it says so. Although seriously wounded by hostile fire, Corporal Calles crawled forward toward an enemy emplacement. Reaching the position, he attempted to launch his rifle grenade, but was mortally wounded by a sudden burst of fire. So of course. Um, Conspiracy theorists will say, oh, this is probably something that was uh, made up to cover up uh, Ford's murder, and uh, Callis was close to Ford, so that's why he also had to, to die, you know. But let's be serious here, you know. Um, this is a Silver Star citation. There were supposed to be several witnesses and stuff. I mean, I don't believe for a second that this is fake. This guy was killed in action uh, near his colonel. Uh, in heroic circumstances, he's one of the few guys of the 65th who received the Silver Star. So let's respect that and um, use it as an, one more piece of evidence that, that the patrol really did reach the German lines. Now, um, in the first part of the video, I also showed you a letter from uh, Ford's father-in-law, so Kurt von Seidlitz, where he's saying, the story is told that Colonel Ford was shot by one of the men of the patrol. I didn't have uh, the, the responses uh, that the army sent and then that Kurt Seidlitz sent afterwards, but now I've obtained a copy of all of uh, Ford's file, and in the file there's uh, von Seidlitz's response. And just like me, he says, uh, regarding the fate of Colonel George Ford on uh, 4 January 1945, as given in the report of Captain Daniel R. Logan, is very interesting and valuable, killing all the various stories which went around. So you see that Kurt von Seidlitz um, is satisfied with the information. Uh, as we saw, Captain Daniel Logan was in an artillery unit. He was not in the 65th. He gives a very detailed report of what happens. 
uh, mentions that Colonel Ford basically single-handedly walked towards the German bunker and uh, was shot and killed in that manner. And uh, he doesn't believe that that report is fake, and neither do I. So once again, more evidence that um, Ford was killed by the Germans. Um, now, another interesting uh, line of evidence that can be looked for is the serial numbers of the soldiers. So when I made the first part of the video, I hid the soldiers' family names and serial numbers uh, so that they would stay anonymous. And I hid the beginning of the serial numbers. And that was actually not a very smart idea from me, on my part, because the serial numbers mean something, you see? Uh, when the serial numbers start with one or with two, that means those are regular soldiers, or soldiers from the National Guard. So people who are actually motivated to be soldiers, people who volunteered for the army. Whereas when the serial number starts with a three, that means it's a number for somebody who was drafted into the army. And of course, uh, everybody knows that when somebody is a volunteer for the army, uh, he's probably much more motivated uh, to be there than somebody who was drafted and who maybe hates the army, right? So I'm curious to see now, uh, of these eight guys who uh, shot themselves or wounded themselves with their own grenades, how many of them uh, have serial numbers, well, how many of them were draftees and how many of them were volunteers? So I have uh, a list of about a hundred and something names of, the, of soldiers of the 65th. This is a sample of it. And you can see there's a mixture of uh, guys who have uh, serial numbers starting with one, so volunteers and guys with three, so draftees. And I made a little quick statistic of my list. Uh, basically, 65% of the soldiers um, have uh, serial numbers corresponding to volunteers and only 35% corresponding to draftees. So let's look now at uh, the casualties that occurred, these guys who shot themselves. Well, of the eight guys, uh, serial numbers are listed for uh, six of them, and all six of them are draftees. None of them were volunteers. So I think that that's, again, pretty strong evidence uh, that these wounds are probably for the most part self-inflicted. These are probably guys who don't like being in the army, and they decided to, to wound themselves to get out of the lines. And uh, we, if we compare, these are the, all the people who were killed or wounded during the month of January in the 65th. All of them except one, so there's 11 guys and only one of them is a drafty. All the other ones are volunteers. So you see, all the guys who are uh, suspect of having wounded themselves are all drafties, and all the guys who were wounded or killed, so presumably might have, you know, exposed themselves more, uh, all of them except one are volunteers. So that, I think, statistics uh, speaks a lot. Um, and then, of course, uh, some people commented that, uh, you know, out, out of these eight, maybe most of them were accidents and stuff. Look, maybe one or two of them were accidents, but uh, the American witness that we found, you know, he, he saw two of these guys on the same night, and he mentions that both of them were self-inflicted wounds. He saw the guys with his own eyes, you know. And um, honestly, when you have so many cases occurring in just a few days, I mean, I think you're in denial if you think that, that all of them are, are simply accidents. Other people said that these eight self-inflicted wounds, they weren't, that wasn't that much of a big uh, number compared to 2,000 people uh, in the 65th Infantry. And so I decided let's compare with some of the other units that had been uh, in the area in the months before. So we'll start with the 517th uh, Parachute Infantry Regiment. It also has uh, roughly 2,000 soldiers, like the 65th. And for the month of August, they say they have uh, one case of self-inflicted wound. For the month of September, they have seven cases. So that's actually very similar to the 65th. In October, they have uh, three cases. And um, in November, three again. And then let's look at the first Special Service Force, another unit that has uh, roughly 2,000 men. For them in, uh, September, in, in August, sorry, it only mentions two accidental gunshot wounds. So of course, how do you know the difference if it's accidental or self-inflicted? I think it's usually probably pretty hard to know, to know the difference, you know? Maybe this, uh, the doctor classified it as accidental so that the guy wouldn't get into trouble. You know, it's, it's kind of hard to know. Anyway, 
two, sub, uh, two accidental gunshot wounds in August, in September uh, one, and in October five accidental gunshot wounds, and then it does mention as well one self-inflicted wound with a grenade. So basically what we can see is that the, these eight wounded uh, for the month of December for the 65th, that is higher uh, numbers, slightly higher numbers than, than the other units in the area. Now I would like to specify the 65th, see, was a regular unit, whereas the, the two other units are both paratrooper units. So they were made up of 100% people who volunteered. And of course those, those kinds of units are going to have soldiers that are more motivated, so it will be less, less uh, they would have lef less of a tendency to want to wound themselves to get out of the lines. So an infantry unit can't just be compared directly with a paratrooper unit. But we can see it's slightly higher, but not really that much higher. But what is special with the case of the 65th is that these eight cases of probably self-inflicted wounds happen over a very brief period, just over six days. So it's as if at that period there's kind of an epidemic starting. And when you read the account of the American witness uh, who mentioned seeing two uh, of the Puerto Ricans who had, uh, who had wounded themselves on purpose, what he mentions in his account is that he spoke with some Puerto Rican guys and said, we just saw a guy who shot himself in the hand. And then those same guys he spoke to, one of them shot himself in the hand just afterwards. So that's the kind of epidemic aspect of it that we can see with the 65th and that we don't know about for the other units because the other units uh, didn't document what happened with these self-inflicted wounds. They just mentioned them in their monthly report, but there's no details available. And as a last word, um, on December 24th, when the eighth guy wounds himself, it says that Colonel Cordero is going to have an investigation about what, what, what's going on. So that shows that the unit thinks that it's self-inflicted, otherwise they wouldn't make an investigation. And then what happens is that there's no more self-inflicted wounds for several days. In fact, for the rest of December, for January and for February, there's only three cases that are mentioned in the unit history. So basically, after they, after they make their investigation, the numbers go down and seem to be kind of normal. And the fact that there's only three cases in all uh, January and February shows that having eight cases in six days in December was something rather abnormal. So anyway, that's the statistics side. Not any hard data, but we can, let's say, have a few ideas by comparing with, uh, with the other units. Now, another thing that some people commented on was about the Spanish language. Uh, I mentioned at one point that uh, the 65th was a Spanish-speaking unit, and I was told that that's not correct because uh, the officers could, sp could speak English and the NCOs could speak English. And of course, I totally agree with that. When I meant Spanish-speaking, what I just meant is that for the bulk of the, en of the enlisted men, apparently uh, most of them couldn't speak good English or could not speak English at all. That's the impression I got from my various... Uh, readings about the unit and here you have uh, an American witness who is speaking with guys of the 65th and he says as was common in the 65th infantry almost all of them spoke only Spanish however the sergeant spoke fluent English so that's what I mean when I say it's a Spanish speaking unit is that the average soldiers are speaking Spanish and I did forget to mention something about Colonel Ford I didn't see this written in his military file, but his daughter did tell me that he could speak Spanish. So maybe that's another reason uh, why he was sent to the 65th. Now let's go to Colonel Ford. So I've been able to get a complete copy of his uh, military file. And um, we're not going to do some like psychoanalysis uh, 80 years after his death, especially when, uh, when uh, I'm not a psychoanalyst, okay? But we will take a look at what's written and maybe try to get a slightly better understanding of the man. So the first uh, thing I saw in this file is that uh, one of the other soldiers on the patrol, Gabriel Hurtado, he also wrote a report of what happened, and unfortunately only the second page of his report uh, is still there. The first page is gone. Now I don't know why that page is missing. Of course some uh, conspiracy theorists will say, well obviously it was removed uh, because he must have uh, given some kind of uh, compromising information. 
I don't believe that. Um, this file is preserved at the file uh, at the archives in St. Louis. Uh, that file, that archive burnt down in the 1970s, and it really did burn down. As you're going to see, all the pages here are burnt on one side, and um, perhaps his account was, you know, on the first page of the of the file or something, and that's why it got burnt more than the rest or something. Anyway, or maybe it just got lost. I don't know. So, um, let's look um, at Colonel Ford. Why did he go to the army? So, in one letter he explains this quite clearly. He says, My entrance in the military academy was actuated largely by a desire to enter the air service. So, what he wanted to, to, to do was become a pilot in the, in the air force. And uh, he got into the army in about 1919-1920 and went to West Point, as we said. And after West Point, he did go to the, to the air service and he started his training as a pilot and did several months of training. And what happened is that he had a total of uh, four crashes and in the end they, they said that he just didn't have the, the capacity to be a pilot. So he was uh, washed out of the air service and asked to join some other service in the army. And. Um, he was washed out not because he was an idiot, not at all. Uh, if we look at his uh, grades, for example, what it says here is Lieutenant Ford's grades are very good in everything except flying. His general average is 90%. So uh, all his grades are, are good, are excellent, and only in flying does he have this poor capacity, so that's why he, he got washed out. So uh, he's, a, he's, a, he's a talented person, he's a smart person, but uh, apparently he doesn't have what it takes to be a pilot and I don't think you can blame him for that I mean uh, not everybody uh, you know has the capacity to to fly an airplane especially imagine these are airplanes from the 1920s and stuff so he washed out of the Air Force and uh, then the army asks him so uh, what what's your next uh, choices by order of priority what would you like to do in the army since you're not going to be in the Air Corps so here, uh, in 1925, so when he's getting uh, kicked out of the Air Force, he, he, he makes a list. So first he wants to be in the lighter than air. So that means, I guess, you know, observation balloons and zeppelins, things like that, that still existed back then. Then he says an ordnance, engineers, and the last, the last choice is coastal artillery. And uh, then, in another letter just a few days later, for some reason, he changes the order. He says choice number one is engineers. Choice number two is coastal artillery, but he specifies at Fort Monroe, Virginia. And uh, maybe the reason he chose that is because he wanted to go back close to home, because Ford was from Virginia. And then he lists the other services. And in the end, uh, Ford went to the coastal artillery. And this is a letter where he's demanding his transfer to the artillery. And actually, it seems to be mostly based on uh, facilities for his family. Because Ford, and by that time, was already married and had, uh, I think, two children, or one, one child at least. Uh, and um, he wanted his family to be able to be in a reasonable house, and apparently that wasn't the case with the engineers. So he's making a choice, a career choice, based uh, yeah, just on this housing, which is a bit strange. And uh, the army uh, isn't too happy about this. They're saying that this officer appears to have assumed greater family responsibilities than should be assumed by one of his grade and rank. And in another document, they say that they should discourage officers from having uh, children so, so soon. So after this, Ford uh, does a career for several years in the coastal artillery. And twice in the 1920s and early 1930s, he makes a request to be transferred back to the Air Corps. So you can see that he's apparently not too satisfied with being in the coastal artillery and he wants to go back to his dream, which is the Air Corps. And in uh, 1930 or 1931, when he makes the second request, the, the Air Corps says it very clearly. Uh, Lieutenant Ford should be informed that he will not be considered for a redetail to the Air Corps for flying either at this time or at a future date. So they're saying like, no, there's no coming back to the Air Corps. So, um, if you try to analyze this, you see Ford joined the army just after World War I. So, presumably, uh, all the older officers, or many of the older officers, and also many of the older soldiers, would have been veterans from World War I. He wanted to be a pilot, 
uh, and instead he ends up being in the coastal artillery even though in one of his uh, documents that was his like last choice of career. So you can imagine that uh, he probably had a certain amount of, uh, of disappointment uh, about what happened to him. You know, living in the shadow of World War I veterans, uh, wanting to be a pilot and then ending up uh, in, a, in some uh, coastal artillery unit. That's not the same thing. So presumably he had, he lived with a fair amount of, of disappointment. And uh, he stayed in the coastal artillery uh, until the war started. He never had any uh, infantry experience. And then during the war, his units are listed here. It's more uh, coastal artillery than some kind of, uh, you know, traffic regulation, things like that. Until he reaches the 65th Infantry on December 13th, uh, 1944. So um, I think it, it is, as we said in the first part of the video, rather awkward for somebody who's just spent 20 years in the coastal artillery all of a sudden being sent to command an infantry unit when it's already on the front lines. See, nobody is saying that coastal artillery people are, are incompetent or something. For example, the first special service force that we mentioned earlier, it was commanded for a long time by General Frederick, uh, one of the you know, most famous and best generals of World War II, youngest general of World War II as well, wounded in combat nine times or something. And uh, he was also in the coastal artillery, you know, but he was sent to the first special service force when they were in training and he was training with it for a year or something before they went to combat. Ford, he's just sent to the unit right on the front lines, which is totally abnormal in my opinion. Uh, you can see it's not because he was in the coastal artillery that he didn't know anything about infantry things because uh, amongst his medal he has an expert badge for a submachine gun, automatic rifle, rifle, pistol, and carbine. So presumably he uh, was an excellent shot uh, and knew how to use all those weapons extremely well. Going through Ford's military file, it's obvious he was a very competent and uh, quite appreciated person. Uh, most, of the, most of the comments about him are, uh, are extremely positive. This is just a small sample, see? Exceptionally able officer, hardworking, self-reliant. A capable, energetic, and willing officer, he's exceptionally persevering and has repeatedly, in the face of obstacles, carried out a project in a very efficient manner. A very reliable, conscientious, and efficient officer. General characteristics, usually well suited to the military profession in peace or war. I should especially desire to have, an, uh, to have him in my command in war. So those are very positive, um, very positive comments by his commanding officers. And um, when we saw the first part of the video, um, a few characteristics uh, came out that, that I mentioned and that some people also commented about. So the first thing, so Ford went on this patrol, even though he had no obligation to. So that obviously required bravery and it also required him to be an energetic person, you know, uh, climbing down and up these mountains and whatever when he could just have stayed in his office. And then what we noticed as negative things in the first part of the, of the video is lack of tact. You see, we mentioned that he humiliated Colonel Cordero in front of his, uh, his soldiers. And that's not something that, that an officer uh, who's been in the army for 20 years like Ford should do. You don't humiliate an officer in front of his men unless you want him to, to hate you forever. You know? Then we saw there was a certain amount of distrust of others. Uh, he went on this patrol to the cable house, to the German lines, uh, even though other patrols had been there in the previous days. And what some of the witnesses said is that they, Colonel Ford apparently accused them of not having actually gone all the way there, and he didn't believe that they had really been to the German lines. So he wasn't necessarily trusting his subordinates. Then there's some overconfidence. You see, he's just spent 20 years in the coastal artillery, he comes to the front lines and a couple of weeks later he just decides to lead a patrol on his own um, all the way to the, to the German lines. And what I didn't mention before is that one week before the patrol occurred, the intelligence in Ricken platoon had already sent a, a patrol there to the German cable house and uh, it turned out very badly. Here it briefly mentions it um, in, the, in the reports. Uh, basically, as soon as they got there, they were fired on, and uh, three people were wounded, including the officer who uh, commanded the intelligence and reconnaissance platoon. Um, 
We also mentioned that, that Ford displayed lack of judgment with this patrol because um, he goes, like he literally just leads the patrol right up to the German bunker and then walks up to the bunker. And we don't understand what the point is. Like the soldiers weren't given orders. They weren't told we're going to surround the bunker. We're going to try to get, get a prisoner or something. No. Ford just walks up to the bunker on his own with everybody else sitting there looking at him, not knowing exactly what they're supposed to do. And then there's also, let's say, some stubbornness that came out in the sense that when they reach the German bunker, uh, you know, the, the other soldiers who have been there before, they tell him, Colonel, now we're under German observation and stuff. And instead of listening to them and uh, maybe, you know, lying down uh, under cover, Ford just uh, continues walking towards the German bunker. So those are some impressions that we could have gotten from, uh, from the witness accounts. And uh, now let's see what some of the negative things about him are that are, that are in his uh, military file. So like before, most of these comments are very positive and now I'm just cherry picking some of the negative things. It says he lacks tact in dealing with his subordinates. He displays cock sureness. He's inclined to stubbornness and support of his own opinions and ideas of action. He's inclined to argue with his superiors over trivialities. He has to be guided as to matters requiring judgment. He views acts of others with suspicion and they react accordingly. And then a few more. He's almost too determined. He's very argumentative, very outspoken. He has a tendency to be somewhat strong in his likes and dislikes, which at sometimes colors his attitude. He's never satisfied with anything but superior results. And he acts without considering effects upon others and appears determined to have his own way. So this is very interesting because from... Um, from just a few witness accounts about what happened in Perakav, we kind of had some impressions about him uh, that he might uh, he might be uh, uh, stubborn and uh, and overconfident in his actions during the patrol. And then all these comments made by other American officers, they also all indicate these same like little problems with his personality. That in the end, you know, if if he if he had not been uh, stubborn, if he had maybe listened to the to the men on the patrol if he had maybe trusted the reports of the previous patrol the patrol probably wouldn't have ended up the way it did you know maybe he wouldn't have gone on the patrol if he had he wouldn't have just uh, walked up to the german positions and and, and been shot and uh, what's very interesting here is that uh, when he was being washed out of the air force uh, there's a little report here where the the officers are asking him questions and he's replying and twice they ask this question. So they say in the report, do you realize your mistakes when you are making them? And then he responds. He says, there was only one time when I did not. So that's probably not the, the answer they're hoping for because he had four crashes and apparently he only realized once that he was making a mistake. And then they ask him again, can you tell that you are going to make a mistake before you make it? That is, do you have the idea of going into it without a feeling of confidence? And this is very interesting. This is happening in 1925. And let's fast forward to 1945, the patrol. Imagine when Sergeant Robles told Ford, we are now under German observation. Imagine if he had asked himself these questions. If he had said, do I realize my mistakes before I'm making them, you know? So 20 years later, apparently, uh, he still didn't realize that he was making a mistake in this case, and uh, that's how he got killed, and then the other people in the patrol uh, got killed and wounded as well. So um, that's pretty much all the evidence I can, I can bring to the table for, for this patrol in which two men were killed. To summarize again, uh, I think that despite some strange circumstances, Ford was killed by German fire in front of the German positions. That's what the witnesses say. Uh, Ford's body and uh, Aristides Kallis' body were both found in the German lines. The German witness says that they saw a patrol and that they wiped it out. Um, Kallis received a silver star for his actions on that patrol. So. Um, 
I think that, um, like I said before, Colonel Ford should not have led this patrol the way he did. Uh, he displayed some recklessness when they reached the German lines. And because of that, he was killed, and one of his men was killed, and uh, several other men were wounded. But uh, I think from his file, it's very obvious he was a, a very competent officer. Um, some people misconstrued what I said in the first video. They, they thought because I mentioned eight men shot themselves in the hand that that means that all the Puerto Rican unit was uh, made up of cowards. That's not at all what I'm saying, you see. Uh, Aristides Calas, as we saw, got a silver star for trying to, trying to help Ford. And um, as we saw, the unit consisted of both volunteers and, uh, and uh, draftees. And presumably, uh, these guys, well, not presumably, we saw these guys who shot themselves in the hand uh, were draftees. And uh, presumably, a lot of the guys who were volunteers uh, were, were very good soldiers. That's what I would suspect in any case. So, um, yeah, the unit had some, some problems at that point, but it doesn't, doesn't say anything about the individuals who, who made up the unit. So I hope this clarifies some of the, some of the points that, uh, that were more controversial. And um, if you're interested for more information about what happened uh, in southern France, uh, I've written a book called Autopsy of a Battle, which goes into lots of very interesting details uh, of what happened in the Nice area, just like this story of Colonel Ford's patrol. So that's the end of this video, and I can always be contacted at this email address in case uh, anybody has any interest in, uh, in uh, some kind of uh, World War II research project and they need a bit of help.